My name um, is Sammy Castongue. I um, am programs director for Friends of the Owyhee, which involves kind of a whole lot of um, different programming. But um, here tonight, I'm, I'm here on behalf of kind of my, my background as a geologist. Um, I also still have the pleasure of teaching for Treasure Valley Community College, um, about one, two classes a term, usually geology because it's my background. And then also for University of Oregon in the summertime, I do a geology field course for 400 level majors. So geology is like my rocks, right? That's the main passion that I have. And what I really love about working with, with Tim and Catalan here at Friends of the Hawaii is the chance to go out to the desert with folks like you. Many of you uh, went out to the desert with me to go look explicitly at the rocks. Yes, I like the plants. Yes, I like the animals. Yes, I like the birds. But it's the rocks that really um, you can see from across the valley. You know where you're going to hike and going to look. Um, and that's something that I love about the open expanse of the desert as opposed to some more forested regions. Nothing against forests, but I really like desert. Um, then I'd also like to recognize that this desert land that we are on both here in Ontario as well as the whole Owyhee province that we at Friends of the Owyhee feel like we steward is uh, the ancestral territories of the Northern Paiute people and Western Shoshone and Bannock tribes. Um, I'll talk about that again um, on another slide in a little bit more um, depth. So what we're gonna look at tonight, and I'm gonna keep it to an hour as best I can. A student told me the other day after class, he was like, man, that guy, he can talk way much about rocks. And I can. Uh, but you, tonight, we're gonna get this really um, tight an overarching view of the whole geologic history of the Owyhee. So you're not going to come away as a rock expert. You're not going to come away as exactly knowing all the details of the Owyhee. I'm painting with a really broad, broad brush. Okay. Okay. Maybe a little bit less broad than this, that if you look at this uh, geologic map globe here, um, the Pacific Northwest is all the same color. It's all red. Red just means volcanic. So that is a big part of the story of the Owyhee is the volcanism. But a major point I want to make tonight is there's also some older history before the volcanism. So um, talk a little bit about the spirit of the whole series, uh, then show you some general geography of the Owyhee so you know where some of these locations are at that, we're, um, that I'm focusing on. And then uh, the nine field trips, and I'll put those in geologic or chronologic order rather than just going through every trip and telling you what all the people did for fun, right? Um, this is more, again, on the observations geologically. And then um, I want to make a point to talk about the Owyhee's geodiversity that you'll have a good understanding of by the end, and then um, celebrating our geo heritage. Um, so where is the Owyhee region? Well, many of you um, likely know, you likely have some firsthand knowledge of a lot of these locations, uh, but perhaps you don't. Maybe you're just getting interested in some of these areas or the, the province. And then also we have lots of folks joining us online that might live in New York and have never been to the Owyhee. They're not going to go next summer, but they are enjoying reading about um, this area. The area's rocks, particularly. Um, so you're familiar with the Owyhee. Here's um, a political boundary map. Here we have uh, Idaho, Oregon, and Nevada. So this area is known as the Ion, just like um, Highway 95, the Ion Highway, or what used to be the Ion gas station over there, the extra mile now. Um, so this is one way to look at the region. is divided by political boundaries, right? Um, but actually... I think a, a better way really to think about this is uh, divided um, by um, ancestral territories. So here we have the ancestral territory of the Northern Paiute um, people, which incorporates or, or, or contains part of the Owyhee region, and then also the Shoshone Bannock that also contains a portion of that region. So this is the ancestral territories of these people that were forcibly removed from their homelands once upon a time. Um, and today, they uh, still reside on three reservation lands, actually in all three states of the Ion as well, um, down here um, in McDermott, the uh, Duck Valley Reservation, and then the Burns Paiute Reservation. And in those three locations are folks um, whose 
ancestral peoples lived in this land and hold um, lots of uh, not just deep appreciation, but stories of the land deeper than the stories that I'm going to tell you tonight about the rocks. Okay. Um, so that's the question is where's the Waihi? But here's a little bit more about the answer. There it is. Um, and what do we do? The Friends of the Owyhee, our mission is conservation, advocacy, stewardship, and recreation. So uh, what I'm doing here tonight, talking about the rocks, doing a little bit of education, is connecting, hopefully, ideally, connecting you, whether you live over there or you live over there, or maybe you live in New York, but connecting you as a person with this region. And that's advocacy. I would say that's the conservation habit. Hopefully you're developing a relationship with place. Then uh, we also do stewardship, things like um, cleanups. Adopt a highway is one of my favorites. We walk along Highway 95 and pick up trash. Okay? Uh, but we also do um, things like plantings we've done before or seed collection we hope to do over the spring. And then recreation, right? Many of us get into the Owyhee for the fun, for the recreation, right? Whether it's for floating the river a lot of people nationwide globally have heard the term Owyhee because they floated that river right it's a world famous section of river that's very remote and a lot of people know about it but one thing we try to do here at friends of the Owyhee is not just focus on just the river the what the that one bit or just that one canyon it's really the whole province it's the whole watershed as well as the whole Owyhee front that extends, uh, that you can see from the Treasure Valley. Um, so that's what we consider the Owyhee region, and that's what we collectively care and, and steward, uh, and also recreate in. Um, I wanted to say thank you for those of you that are donors or, or members that are joining us or have been on trips. It's not, it's, uh, we can't do any of this, of course, without that type of attitude is what I wanna say, right? Yes, the donation dollars matter, Yes, the support matters, but really what holds up both of those things is an attitude of support. So uh, thank you for um, those of you in the audience that are our supporters. Okay, um, and if you're um, interested, visit the website. And then I also added um, another website, awaiheewonders.org. It's called a story map that was recently put together. Um, and if you're cocking your head and wondering about that, then uh, go ahead and Google it or uh, put it into your phone and check it out when you go home. It's a beautiful story map, okay? All right, uh, so now you know where the Owyhee region is in general, and where did we go as a, as a group over this um, Owyhee geology series? We went to these nine locations, uh, Sucker Creek and Leslie Gulch, Jump Creek way out there. Um, several of you were on all three of those field trips. Then Jordan Craters, only two people were on that field trip because it was hot and we went to black lava to go walk around. So, you know, it wasn't everybody's cup of tea. Then uh, we went to Lake Owyhee and we uh, went um, by kayak, actually. That was a lot of fun. Then Lower Owyhee Canyon, Brandy and I walked around and looked at some conglomerates and sandstones. Uh, then quite a group joined us out to uh, Silver City over here in Idaho, the forested portion of the, the Owyhees. Uh, then uh, several of us ventured down to the Nevada portion of the Owyhee. So here's the watershed. Okay, here's the Owyhee front that you can see some from the Treasure Valley. And way down here at the tip of the watershed or the headwaters, uh, we went to this mountain range here, this forested mountain range, the Independence Mountains. Good trip. And then uh, lastly, last month, we went to South Mountain um, up here to uh, look at rocks there. Oh, and let me just remind you, all of these trips, we are going to look at rocks, if I haven't said that yet, okay? Um, so what I'm going to do, rather than go in order by the field trip, show you where we went and what we did, um, I want to go in chronologic order by geology. Um, because the point here is, is to talk about geologic history as uh, using the Owyhee as examples. So uh, I know it looks kind of kind of weird, but this is meant to be a human arm. Okay, does that look about right? Okay, there's the thumb down there and shoulder up here. So I use this example a lot for geologic time. Why? Because everybody, well, lots of folks, come with arms, right? So you can use your arm to measure out uh, geologic time. The vast, oh, and I exclude from this cosmologic time. That's the age of the universe. 
So uh, Earth being about 4,600 million years old or 4.6 billion, um, I use these a lot. GA stands for billions of years, MA for millions of years, just for the nomenclature. But starting at 4.6 billion years ago, the Precambrian, this vast amount of geologic time, almost 90% that goes clear down here to my knuckles, um, most, uh, the Owyhee has no rocks of that age, okay? But some of the things that are really important that happened during this time is the rise of oxygen in the atmosphere. So before this time, before about two and a half billion years ago, the air was carbon dioxide rich. There was no oxygen in the air, in the Earth's atmosphere. And then we have the rise of oxygen and then later the rise of macroscopic life. So that just means life that you can see with your own two eyes instead of a microscope. So fossilized organisms like this trilobite. Uh, so just to tell you a little bit about the Precambrian, but as I said, there are no rocks of this age in the Owyhee. And how do I know? Well, we looked for them. Okay, uh, we really did. And we wrote a blog about it. So you can go read about that story or that wild goose chase, it kind of felt like. Um, but in all seriousness, I was really excited to find some Precambrian rocks in uh, the Nevada portion of the Owyhee. That was part of the lure. And it turns out that the, um, the Nevada Bureau of Mining and Geology, uh, kind of the equivalent of Oregon's um, Dogami or Idaho's Idaho Geologic Survey, they have an online map that you can go look at all of these geologic locations and look at all the uh, where all the distributions of rocks. And they had a little brown patch stu uh, standing for Precambrian rocks in this location. I got really excited. Oh, there's Precambrian rocks in the Owyhee. I got to go see those. We looked around and we looked around and we looked around and we looked around. I've been looking at rocks for a long time and I'm starting to feel like, gosh, can I not identify these rocks? So I went to, we came back home a little bummed and I went to my friend who works for the Bureau and I said, will you follow up on this? And he found that there was a clerical error in that map when they were transferring it from paper to GIS. It wasn't labeled, so they just labeled it wrong. So there we go. There are no Precambrian rocks in um, the Owyhee drainage that have ever been identified, uh, but we'll keep looking. Okay, so what um, kind of, or what age of rocks are there in the Owyhee then? So what I've done here, I've just expanded this 11% to fill this whole thing now. Okay, so we have the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, and the Cenozoic um, periods of time. There are some um, Paleozoic rocks that represent ancient seafloor sediments in the Independence Mountains. Then also in the Independence Mountains, there are some late Paleozoic structures, some faults that are there. There are no rocks of that age that were deposited, but there are faults of that age. I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. And then during the um, Mesozoic, the mid to late Mesozoic, there was intrusions of granites, in the Silver City area, okay? Um, what we know of as the Owyhees, as they're labeled on the topographic map. And then um, most of the geology that we are familiar with, if you've gone out there and looked around at rocks, the vast amount of the Owyhee Desert is known as the Owyhee Volcanic Plateau. Pretty much everywhere else because uh, it's, well, it's vast. And uh, that is the last 16 million years or so. So this is kind of the distribution of age of rocks in the Owyhee, just so you know. All right. Um, any questions so far? Anybody? Good. Okay, I just wanted to check. All right, everybody's doing all right. I haven't gotten to the nine field trips yet. So if you're like, oh man, this is way more intense than I thought it would be. Okay, then feel, it's okay. You can walk out, it doesn't hurt my feelings. Okay, um, but uh, we're gonna talk now a lot about plate tectonic settings sort of the, the background of what has been going on here for X millions of years, okay? Uh, so here's a picture of the Independence Mountains. This is Jack Peak, uh, the peak that we um, picked out to go walk to or hike to. And um, here on this ridge, the first rocks that we walked up to are quartzites, is kind of what they're called. But just think of them as a quartz-rich sandstone or a sandstone. Okay, I'll drop the quartz name, right? 
Uh, they're a beach sand. If you look at them, they're really fine grained, uh, nice little round grains of quartz. Um, so that represents a beach-like environment. And there's also some quartzites up here at the top. Now in between, there's a rock um, called chert. It's this black stuff that's right here. And actually the saddle up here is made of this black stuff. It's also a sedimentary rock that forms way, way, way out in the ocean uh, where there's actually not much silt or sand that's coming in from rivers. This is way too far away from river input that the only sediment that's raining down to the bottom of the ocean is little grains of silica dioxide that precipitate out of the water and sink down. And that takes a long time to build up a really small layer. Uh, but it's a rock called chert. Um, so long ago, about 485 million years ago, the Ordovician time period, that's the age of this whole package of sedimentary rocks, uh, this is a Ron Blakey from um, University of um, Arizona uh, reconstruction based on sedimentary rocks of what the North American continent kind of looked like at that time. So just to, you know, if you're squinting your eyes, there's Colorado underwater, right? Uh, there's Montana, mostly underwater. Okay, uh, so what this is meant to show is the shoreline. And then the continental shelf is what's kind of in blue here. And then the deeper marine sediments out this direction. And so where we're talking about, here's Idaho. We're talking about right there, right? Once was a beach, but now we're at the edge of the continental shelf and the edge of deep marine. So uh, this is what a geologic reconstruction or cross section might look like of that time. Um, it's backwards, unfortunately. But this is what we call a passive margin where the continent is eroding into a, the clastic sediments. Those are just eroded stream sediments out into the ocean. And then at some point on the edge of um, the shelf, you might get some carbonate deposits. Carbonates like limestone, okay? Um, and then finally the oceanic crust where we might get some of that deposition of chert. Okay, here's an outcrop of chert with my best friend, Rocky Hammer. Okay, um, so the four rocks, or the three rocks that we saw here, quartz sandstone up here. There's actually some limestone in the range over. This is the only limestone sample that I brought here. Okay, um, and I didn't break it into smaller pieces because I'm so, it's such a treasured piece. Um, and then also this chert, okay, this black chert. And I recall the joke of the day, um, or the term of the day being silicious ooze. Right. Uh, Becky was really impressed by that one. Sounds like a band name or something like that. Right. Silicious ooze. OK. Um, so just to recap there in the Independence Mountains, we have the oldest rocks of the Owyhee. They were actually formed on the edge of ancient continent in what you might consider a proto Pacific Ocean. That was the base of the Owyhee and everything from that is either tearing it down or lava on top of it. Okay, so let's uh, tear it down a little bit. Well, build it up first. Um, during that hike, so Jack's Peak is over here, I noticed um, on in a, a sort of adjacent hanging wall over here, a fault that's putting these grayish rocks, or the quartz sandstone, on top of these nice well-bedded cherts. Okay, uh, there's the, the line there. I drew the red line and then an uh, arrow showing the hanging wall moving up. And that's defined as a thrust fault. So this thrust faulting, uh, or uh, probably involved in mountain building, during that time, geologically, is what's known as the building of the Nevada Plano. You've probably heard of the Alta Plano in South America that exists today, right? But this is a geologic past, a remnant of 230 million years ago, a mountain range that begin building into the ancestral Rocky Mountains. We might think about them as the Rocky Mountains today. And at that time, the mountains were so high, it was like a high Tibetan plateau or a Nevada Plano. Okay, so these thrust vaults were involved in shortening the crust. If this was elongate sedimentary rocks, then they were thrust up on one another. So there's an extreme amount of shortening and thickening that's happening. Okay. Uh, so here's a couple of diagrams of what that might look like. This is a physical model uh, from a course I took at University of Oregon where we laid out these sedimentary rocks and then took a 
in and just just like a snow shovel or something like that. And lo and behold, you make these wrinkles in the crust. And similarly, just a nice cartoon that shows the fault offsetting this nice marker bed here, pushing one over the other. Okay, um, then something maybe you're more familiar with because you've touched it. How many people have been to Silver City before? Okay, about half of you, I'd say, and I hope the other half of you can make it sometime soon. It's a really nice road in. It's a quaint little place to go, and they have this beautiful uh, Catholic church up on top of the hill, and I love it so much because it's built right into granite, and I think that's just awesome. Okay, uh, so this whole town in the middle of a granite province, uh, these granites, granite is a, a magma, essentially or it was a magma until it froze, right? Uh, so uh, imagine a magma chamber at depth, like say 10 kilometers below Earth's surface, and that magma is feeding volcanoes that are above, really high above. So uh, that might look like something like this, as we have compression along the edge of North America. There's those thrust faults out there, those that are thickening the crust and um, of the Independence Mountains. But then over here, further towards Silver City, there's a subduction that's creating magma in the mantle that buoyantly rises upwards and coalesces into these big things we call batholiths or plutons or magma chambers. And there sits the granite. Unless the conditions are right, some of that can out the top and be volcanic eruptions. So again, this is actually from the Andes, Andes, Indian mountains. So the analogy is still the same here of the Nevada Plano out here and then uh, the Idaho batholith here. Okay, so that's kind of the plate tectonic setting at this time, but I want to zoom in a little bit to this idea of these batholiths, why there's so much granite. Now, I'm not saying that the whole Silver City area was one big magma chamber. No, instead, there was one magma chamber that intruded and then froze. And then another one intruded next to that, or maybe through it, or maybe just a, you know, a couple of kilometers away from it. But over millions of years of this subduction occurring and occurring and occurring, and more magma coming up and coming up and coming up, the batholiths and uh, the plutons end up intruding one another and forming this really big batholith. So that's why we have granites that fill up a large part of this portion of the Owyhees, but even more so northern Idaho, right? All the way from the Sawtooths, all the way to Sandpoint to the north. Okay? It's a huge granite batholith. Okay, so that's the origin of those granites is via subduction. Uh, then these rocks are hot, right? Magma, hot, right? Makes sense. So these hot liquid rocks that are injecting the crust, well, there was stuff around it, right? They're not just injecting into air, otherwise that'd be a volcano. This is a magma chamber. So that magma is intruding something. Well, what was there to intrude? It was those sedimentary rocks from before, right? That were being laid down in the passive margin and then thickened by thrust faults. The granite intruded these rocks and then metamorphosed the surrounding, well, those surrounding rocks. So uh, this is from a, a geology textbook, but it shows this igneous pluton, okay? Um, and then um, decreasing as a, uh, with the distance is the grade of metamorphism. So you get really high grade metamorphism next to the chamber and then decreasing away, okay? The analogy here is something like you turn clay into porcelain by baking it longer, right? Or more intensely. Um, so as these rocks intruded, those previous sedimentary rocks, they made some really beautiful metamorphic rocks. Here is uh, some nice. You can tell it's a nice because it's a nice looking rock, right? No. Okay, a nice, G-N-E-I-S-S, -S, is a type of metamorphic rock that we classify by being banded. It has these really dark mafic bands and then these really lighter colored felsic bands. Okay, so that's a nice... And then we have this schist over here. That's schist with an S, okay? A uh, nice wavy folded schist with lots of mica. And then um, here, one of the most uh, beautiful rocks that I've, I feel like I've ever come across anywhere, not just in the Owyhee, 
is this really beautiful coarse grained marble. Okay, yeah, a marble. There is a marble, a couple of marble outcrops here in the Hawaii there at South Mountain. And these rocks are actually so beautiful that it encouraged Brandy even to take a picture. It was the first time after like six trips that she took a picture of rocks, right? Uh, so I knew we hit the pretty rocks, right? The cool rocks. So uh, they are very, um, they're very pretty and they tell a really wonderful geologic story too. Um, if you're interested in some of this marble, back on the merch table back there, there's a bunch of you know, small golf ball, the softball size samples of this marble that you're welcome to take home. That's your free rock of the day. Okay, the special Hawaii marble. Okay, don't lose it though. All right, um, next after this granite intruded, so just to back up, remember uh, those sedimentary rocks that were all flat, they had been thrusted up into this large Nevada Plano. So the crust for millions of years because of subduction has been thickening and thickening and thickening and thickening into a huge mountain range. And then over here, you have all this granite that's intruding. Now, if this subduction stops, or if you stop pushing on something like a spring, then there's bound to be some sort of rebound as it relaxes. And so that's exactly what happened to Western North America, the entire Western North America, all the way from, you know, uh, Montana, northern Montana, all the way to the Rio Grande Rift in New Mexico. The whole thing, and you probably recognize it as Basin and Range Province, if you've ever driven across Nevada, right? You go up and you go down, you go up and go down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Um, and that is because these normal faults, okay, here's the one in the edge of the Independence Mountains now, there's the thrust fault, but now I'm looking at this normal fault that has the well-bedded chert that's been dropped down, okay? And that's the same situation across the whole province of Nevada, or really the whole basin range or Great Basin province, where these normal faults have allowed this block to move down relative to the other. And why down? Because this is accommodating extension, right? Just imagine a bookshelf where there's no book end and they just kind of slide down. Not only are they going down, but they're extending out. So the crust was extended during this gravitational collapse. And that actually continues today. The basin and range is still an active geologic province. Talk to anybody who lives at the Wasatch Front in Salt Lake City. And they have a lot of earthquake drills, right? Because there's a big fault that's right there. That's one of these basin and range faults. Okay. Um, and this was about the best picture I took during the Independence Mountain trips to show this, but this is from the top of Jack's Peak. And as you look down the glacial valley down here, there's a fault down here and a range, and then a fault down here and a range before you get to the edge of the fault or the, the edge of this range and out into the caldera. Okay, um, so basin and range certainly did affect the Owyhee plateau before it was a volcanic plateau, okay? And then even today, after all this volcanism in the Sheep's Head Mountains, there's still evidence that the basin and range is still encroaching into the Owyhee and breaking up the volcanics, okay? I won't come back to the basin and range province, but just wanted you to know that this is ongoing today, okay? Oh yeah, there's a picture, right? Look at all those slugs walking across. So there's your range, basin, range, basin, and each one of those bounded by a normal fault. Okay, then um, going chronologically still, um, after, um, you know, the intrusion of granites and some basin and range faulting, things started to look different. Some anomalous activity began. Um, so before this, we're full of sedimentary rocks and faulting, and the volcanism that occurred wasn't the external volcanism, the volcanoes that were happening, those all eroded away. We're only seeing the intrusive uh, igneous magmas, right? Now, um, these are all different ages, but let's just say about 20 to 25 million years. We start to see all across the Hawaii, anywhere that the canyons are deep enough to cut down there, you see rhyolite domes, okay? Um, you have, this is uh, one from a field trip, the dam rhyolite. There's the Owyhee Dam right over there. That's why it's called the dam rhyolite, not because it's, you know, bad rock or anything. Okay, but there's the, the dome shape. 
and it extends a little bit over on the edge over here where you can find some obsidian and pumice. Okay, um, so there's one rhyolite dome, the Birch Creek rhyolites, the Three Forks rhyolites, all in dome shape. Okay, um, so we have this, this period of these thick emerging rhyolite domes that are just dotting the landscape all through the province. Okay, we don't know exactly how many there are because they're covered up by later volcanism. Okay, oh yeah, and this was the one that we did by kayak. Hey, doesn't that look fun, right? Uh, so we all jumped in our boats. We went over there to go look at the rhyolite and pretty much just boated around and had fun. Okay? I had fun talking to folks about rocks, but they were really there to boat, right, or to kayak. Okay? Just being honest, just being honest. Okay. Um, then uh, during and uh, slightly before, during and slightly after all of these domes of rhyolite are coming up. You, uh, the surrounding area is mostly calm, or I'll say fairly calm, because those effusive lava domes are coming out. Um, this is, a, again, a, a textbook image, but this is showing depositional environments, and I just want to focus on these two, okay, the lake environment and the fluvial environment. So if you have uh, from a higher mountain range or, say, like a volcanic mountain chain that's there, and a road or um, and water that's coming out of that mountain chain out to the coastal plain, then the sedimentary basins in between them are some of these lake environments and fluvial, fluvial is river, river environments. Okay, and that's exactly what uh, Pat, Dr. Pat Fields and many others who have worked in um, the Sucker Creek formation have um, observed throughout the whole stack of stratigraphy of the Sucker Creek Formation. It's mostly siltstones. There's some clay stones like uh, that are full of bentonite. And anywhere that you look in these, there's uh, bound to be some leaf fossils. And as Dr. Pat Fields is looking through this stratigraphy of all these leaf fossils and looking through and identifying each of these species, he identified species from lowlands that you might imagine, you know, wetland kind of swampy species. And that you might imagine, but he also found evidence of conifer forests, of trees that were growing way up here at tree, line, tree line. So that suggests that this depositional basin, the Sucker Creek Basin that had formed down here, had a really high gradient from really high alpine territory with flowing water downhill, taking all the seeds and all the leaves from uphill and then dumping in them into a lake or a fluvial floodplain down below. Okay, um, so things were mostly calm during this time, mostly erosion and deposition into this basin. Okay, that is until about 15.8 uh, million years ago, uh, and that was rudely interrupted. Okay, the precursor were those rhyolite domes, but those are nice and calm. Then, um, kind of all of a sudden, at 15.8 million years ago, was a large eruption. No, 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 huge eruption. No, no. Mega eruption, no, no, super volcano. That's actually the word that we use, super volcanic eruption. How many people have heard of that, a super volcano? Okay, what's the super volcano that you think of? Yellowstone. Yellowstone, okay, perfect, hold on to that, right? Hopefully that's what others were thinking as well, right? So we have um, from this gigantic 18 kilometer wide hole in the ground or caldera, so a caldera is a type of volcano that doesn't build up because it pours out lava. Instead, the magma chamber that's down here all evacuates all at once, and the land falls in on itself. So instead of being a mountain, it's a big hole in the ground, but it's still a volcanic edifice. So all this 18-kilometer, well, this is one interpretation, 18-kilometer area blows out violently a pyroclastic explosive eruption for probably tens of years. We don't really know how fast or slow this stuff happens, but there's a ton of material that came out of this. You probably, you know, we've all, uh, hopefully not we've all, but maybe you've been to Leslie Gulch. Hopefully you've seen pictures of Leslie Gulch, but if you haven't, go. It's a very beautiful location, picturesque. This is an outcrop of um, volcanic tuff. A tuff is a rock that's solely made of volcanic ash. That's all it is, just volcanic ash. And there's two types of tuff. There's ash fall tuffs, where the volcano blows the ash out. 
and just kind of falls down, you know, rains down, nice and docile. And then there's ash flow tuff, where there's so much that comes out that the cloud, the big mushroom cloud, collapses on its own weight because it's rock, and it flows down the landscape or across the landscape in a big fiery ash cloud. Okay, that's called an ash flow tuff. And that's what we have here at Leslie Gulch, that as this hole in the ground is forming because the stuff is erupting out and it's gradually getting deeper and deeper and deeper, this stuff is just falling down into its own hole and filling its own hole while there's just a little bit that's going out to the side. Okay, so we have all this ash fall tuff that accumulates in the center of this caldera. Okay, um, now if you walk around as this researcher did um, and, and look at all of the fragments that are out there and how welded this material is, he can do some calculations on the volume. And I already put the volume up here at 650 cubic kilometers. Why isn't that blowing your mind? Wait, okay, you need scale. Um, Mount St. Helens. Everybody remember Mount St. Helens or at least seen pictures of it? Boom, big violent eruption, 1980. Okay, uh, that was one cubic kilometer of material, okay? This was 650 cubic kilometers of 650 times the size of Mount St. Helens. And that's why we call them super volcanoes, right? So here's Mount St. Helens, one cubic kilometer, uh, Mount Pinatubo. Then we go down. Here's the Yellowstone eruption 1.3 million years ago at 250 cubic kilometers. Okay. And then the next uh, largest size of Yellowstone eruption, 630,000 years ago, was 1,000 cubic kilometers. So we're sitting somewhere between those two cubes in reference to the small Mount St. Helens cube up there. Okay, massive super volcano eruption, but why? Okay, let me back up and um, talk a little bit about why. This is the observation, we see the stuff there, but the why is related to one of these things called a mantle plume. And this is just a little bit of oil that's rising, uh, or I think it's actually it's inky water that's rising through oil or something, or maybe the other way around. This is just a physical model that shows something like a plume. Okay, but uh, what most people think, and there are alternative working hypotheses to this, is that one of th a thing kind of like this, but of rock, has been rising from the core mantle boundary, which is about 2,700 kilometers deep. And it's been buoyantly rising and rising and rising and rising and rising, kind of like a lava lamp. You know, the density is just kind of rising, rising, rising. And then at about 16 million years ago, after rising for who knows how long, it finally hit the base of the lithosphere, kind of like the crust, the base of the crust. And it hit at about McDermott. And when it hit, it melted the base of the lithosphere, underwent decompression melting, and then all of these lavas started to come out, these big caldera forming events. That started with McDermott, Okay, and then as the North American plate, plate tectonics, has been moving in this direction, the, the plume is stationary. So as it moves over the plume, it leaves a wake or a track in its wake, right? Uh, so we have McDermott, and then uh, the Owyhee Humboldt caldera, and then the Jarbridge caldera, and Peekaboo, and so on and so forth, until you get to modern day. Yellowstone. Okay, so actually, modern day Yellowstone has its origins down here in the Owyhee volcanic plateau. Okay, actually, between McDermott and this Owyhee um, Humboldt caldera. Okay, so I think that's pretty neat. And this is what dominates the story of the Owyhee from here on. And actually, if you go walk around, you go hike, you go look at rocks, it's pretty much evidence of this, all the volcanic rock that's out there, all the basalt and all the rhyolite. In some way, most of it's related to that. And you can see how this fills up a really large area of the ion. Okay, um, pretty neat part of the Owyhee. Well, let's fast forward a little bit more. Also related to this event, besides the caldera forming eruptions, there's also some basaltic lava that forms. Basalt um, is like kind of like Hawaii, where it's nice and runny and flowy. Not like Mount St. Helens, it's all explosive. So some basalt forms, and we have 
flow after flow after flow after flow after flow in this area, kind of like just pancake after pancake after pancake um, of basaltic lava. And you can see that here in Owyhee Canyon, or sorry, uh, Lake Owyhee. So back to field trip number five, we did take a look at the dome that's over there, but this was a uh, this is a good experience to talk also about the stack of um, Owyhee basalt lavas. Okay, and those are about 13 million years old. Now, how did those lavas get up there on the top? Right. Well, basalt or magma forms in the mantle, and it has to get up there somehow. Those get there by a feature called a dike, kind of like a like a water dike right? Like you might make on the surface. I imagine that's where this early terminology came from. And the lava is forcing it up itself up through weaknesses in the rock. And then it freezes over time, leaving these dikes. And actually my TVCC class, we were just out there a couple of weeks ago, uh, looking at one of these beautifully exposed basaltic dikes. And I mean, that stuff's hot. It's 1200 degrees Celsius next to these cold rocks. So it ends up making a nice baked contact. Those are the orange bits on either side is a little bit of baking. Okay, kind of like that contact metamorphism. Um, so if you drive along this road, keep your eye, well, on the road if you're driving, but if you're riding on the road, then keep your eye on the outcrop and you'll see dozens of these dikes. It's actually what we call a dike swarm because there's so many of them. And there's relatively few um, in the nation. And together with these that are throughout the Wallawas, they're called the Chief Joseph Dyke Swarm. And this whole dike swarm, we think, and some geologists exclude the Owyhee basalts from this because of their chemistry, um, but all of these, this dike swarm feeding all of these basalts on the surface are known as the Columbia River flood basalts. Okay, Columbia River because they flow down the Columbia River all the way to the ocean. And actually, haystack rock that's made of basalt is a chemically identical as the stuff that you would see over above Weezer, right? Uh, part of the Columbia River flood basalts, which is pretty cool. Okay, I think everything's cool about rocks, though, right? Okay, um, so fast forwarding a little bit uh, more than only 13,000 years. So notice that, you know, the further we get towards today, the better record of the rocks we have. That's just kind of how it works because older stuff erodes away, right? We lose the record or it gets covered up. Now, um, starting about 13 million years ago, and I could probably adjust some of the numbers here to be a little bit more precise, but we'll say 13. There is a large zone. So here's the um, here's uh, Lake Owyhee, just for reference in there, okay? Um, the Oregon-Idaho Graben, a Graben in German just means to dig. So imagine just a big hole. Okay, there's a fault or faults on this side and on this side, normal faults that are allowing this whole area to go down. Okay, so it's again that normal faulting situation. Remember the basin and range we talked about a while ago? Extending the crust and dropping basins down. This is the evidence of the basin and range coming back into Oregon or back into this area because of pre-existing weaknesses in the crust. So it made this vast low area through here. And in that low area, the Treasure Valley that hadn't really formed yet began to collect sediments. So here in Lower Canyon, uh, this is one of, this is a canyon I, I like to hike up quite a lot. Um, this is Deer Butte. Uh, I think we hiked up there and did some yoga one time looking at Deer Butte. Um, Deer Butte is sitting on top of these basaltic lavas from the previous slide. And then on the very, uh, excuse me, the basaltic lavas are down here. Then right on top of them is a rock called a conglomerate. A conglomerate is like a, like river cobbles. Okay, think of just a gravel bar out there by the river, except made into a rock. So it's a rock that's made of lots of small rounded rocks. Okay, there's an ex a sample of it out there in the hallway if you don't believe me after this. Okay, go check it out. Kind of looks like cement. Imagine, or sorry, like concrete. Okay, just little rocks inside of a big rock. So there's a nice conglomerate ledge. And then all the way up the side of Deer Butte, you go sandstone, siltstone, sandstone, siltstone, sandstone, siltstone. Wonderful environment for preserving uh, petrified wood. 
Okay. Um, there's also shell fossils. There's also some mammal fossils, I guess, that you can find in some of these as well. Okay. Of the Deer Butte formation. So we have starting at about 13 million years ago and extending into the Pliocene, probably 8 million years ago, is this accumulation of sediments of the Deer Butte formation, really making up where we live, the Owyhee Front. Okay. All right, now the front, if you're over in uh, Boise, Nampa, or um, Homedale, is actually made up of this unit called the Jump Creek Rhyolite. Hey, remember those rhyolites that were coming out of the ground 10 million years ago? Well, it turns out they're still coming out of the ground. So rhyolites came out before Yellowstone Hotspot and the caldera. And then the caldera blanketed everything in ash, and now we get the resurgence of some of these lava domes. Okay, so the Jump Creek rhyolite um, uh, was in place, and it's a pretty big, uh, really large plateau. And then the, as the Treasure Valley is forming, this range bounding fault, a normal fault, drops the Treasure Valley down relative to the Jump Creek rhyolite. So that's what makes up the Owyhee Front, if you're ever wondering why it's so steep. There's a big fault that's right there. It's not active, okay, at least it's not mapped as active, but that has been lowering the valley for millions of years, and the valley has been collecting those, the sediments. Okay? Uh, we took a trip to this one. Uh, we went and climbed up near Jump Creek, and we also went, put on our nice orange vests, if you guys recall, to go uh, right along the road to look at some of these rocks. Now, gotta tell you, people were not impressed with that one. You're probably already sitting here thinking like, what, you took them along the road? That's what we do in geology. It's rocks, they're exposed, we go look at them. Okay, lesson learned. Don't take Friends of the Owyhee along road out crops to go look at rocks, okay? Uh, so if you come along next year, I won't do that to you. Okay, um, now there's a whole bunch of events that I'd like to kind of just do an FYI on, but they weren't part of our field trip series but they're really important. Erosion to the modern landscape. I mean, it's the Owyhee Canyon lands. I haven't said anything about the canyons yet, right? True, okay, because the canyons aren't the rocks, right? The rocks are emplaced and then the canyons form in those. But still, it's very worth asking the question, how did the canyons form? So uh, similar to, or from the last slide, the Owyhee Range Front Fault is dropping the Treasure Valley down. Okay. And then what we call Pliocene Lake Idaho, it probably wasn't one huge vast lake, but probably multiple lakes in different locations at different times that filled in the Treasure Valley. And then when it catastrophically flooded and formed much of Hell's Canyon, not the whole thing, but when it emptied, because there was no Snake River before that, and as it emptied, it cut Hell's Canyon. So imagine you have this perched lake, and here's ocean level that's way out here, right? And there's nothing in between them. There's no river. The Snake River is not attaching these two. But then the canyon forms in between, and base level gets lowered. So now the Owyhee Plateau and the water that's here, or at least in the Treasure Valley, is connected to the ocean. So in between, Hell's Canyon is cut. So then in the plateau, all of the rest of the canyons are cut probably Sucker Creek, most of Owyhee Canyon, all of the forks, probably all have about the same history and about the same timing. Is there about the same age as Hell's Canyon? Okay. Um, and then there, uh, after the canyon formed, there was tons of lava uh, from various younger events, uh, basaltic lava, pouring into the actual canyon that made dams. And then the river would back up into these large lakes and then catastrophically flood through those dams. And here's a cute paper about that if you want to read it, but it's called Owyhee River Intra Canyon Lava Flows. Does a river give a dam? Yeah, I thought that was a pretty cute title. Okay, then um, also uh, related to these Pleistocene lakes, or sorry, uh, uh, Pleistocene times, we think of that as the Ice Age, right? Just think of you know, continental glaciation up north and alpine glaciation. The Steens Mountains were glaciated. We saw evidence in the Independence Mountains for glaciation. And then also there's a small portion um, up by War Eagle Mountain and Turntable 
where there's clear evidence of glaciation up in the Owyhees too. So there was some glaciation, but mostly during the Pleistocene, what was occurring down here uh, as uh, from the Pacific Ocean, large, a large amount of water is coming from the Pacific Ocean and then dumping because of the cold air to the north where the ice is at and the warmer air in the south. There's a gap here where tons of rain falls. And it built up these huge pluvial lakes, like Lake Bonneville might be one that you've heard of, okay, the Salt Lake today, uh, Lake Lahontan down in Nevada. And then also here's Lake Alvord. Okay, here's the Steens Mountains, Alvord Desert, but that was actually full of water. Today it's a playa. And when it was full of water, uh, we rec I recently um, talked to this feller and, and relearned about this story. Okay, uh, but it actually toppled over a small drainage into the Owyhee drainage through Crooked Creek, which is pretty neat. So that one's called Late Pleistocene Lane Outburst Flooding from Pluvial Lake Alvord into the Owyhee, Oregon. So these weren't part of our field trip series, but nonetheless, they're really important events because of their erosion of the modern landscape to cover. Okay, but let's go back to the last field trip. Okay, well, it wasn't the last, but it's the last chronologically. These were the youngest rocks we went to look at, 10,000 years or so. Okay, these are Jordan craters. Okay, here's the uh, coffee pot crater that is... Um, supposedly the source of all of this lava that kept pouring out and pouring out and pouring out. And uh, this is um, Colleen on one of our field trips looking over um, the, the crater itself. And then way on the other side over here, as this lava was pouring down this ancient drainage or river drainage, it actually dammed that drainage and backed up a lake behind it. Okay, this lake and this lake. Today they're known as the cow lakes. And here's the lava flowing in this valley. And here's the river or the lake backed up behind it. Okay, now I say about 10,000 years and then I put a question mark there because it's not well dated. It's not like we have good dating means in rocks for things that are that young. Now this is young enough for carbon dating, but rocks don't, are they're not carbon-based life forms, right? They don't have carbon in them, so we can't use that. Um, so instead, one of the ways to get at this problem was folks drilled to the bottom, not drilled, they took a big pipe and they put it into the bottom of the lake and then they extracted the muck up. And in that muck, they could see the ancient floor before the lake had come in. And on that ancient floor, they found some charcoal remains, probably from fires that started as the lava started coming out. And then those fires, um, you know, incinerated sagebrush that washed down and the lakes filled up. So they dated that stuff, and that stuff they have at something like 8,000 years old. That's the only date that we have. It's an N equals one, and that's not really good enough for science. So I'm going to say still big question mark, okay? and we'd like to investigate that further. Okay. Um, whoa. That was a lot about rocks, right? Okay. I hope you knew what you were getting in for. Okay. Um, I hope what you heard here besides plate tectonics and geologic history, is that the Owyhee is very geologically diverse. Okay? Um, I've had the good fortune as a geologist to run around in a bunch of different areas, Death Valley and Alaska and Mexico. And okay, I love all the places, but I kind of got a thing for the Owyhee, right? Not only do I live here, but it's very diverse. It's always surprising me. There's always something a little bit new about this rhyolite that's over here. Or, oh, I didn't know that there was limestone over there. Okay, um, and it kind of just goes along maybe with living in an area for a while. We call that place-based education, right? Learning about the area that you live in. Okay, um, so here's a whole bunch of the rocks that we looked at. Here's a list of igneous rocks that form from a melt. Here's a list of sedimentary rocks that form uh, as fragments of other rocks and then those metamorphic rocks. So we actually took all of these rocks and labeled a bunch of them. And in the back, you'll probably see, uh, there's a box there, a kit that we put together um, that we used locally for the outdoor school last spring. So local kids got in their classroom, all of these Owyhee region rocks to learn their rock basics. Because these are a bunch of things that I could have ordered from wherever, from Ward's catalog that came from all over the nation of the world. But instead, we got them from the kids' own backyard, 
and brought them to them and showed them the map of the Owyhee where all these rocks come from. Okay, and that's place-based education. So I'd um, ask you, or or let's see, I um, I challenge you, or I really want you to all of the above um, to celebrate with me your or our geo heritage of the Owyhee. This is a vast volcanic plateau with a very long geologic story that spans a whole lot of plate tectonic environments. And I think that's really neat. Okay, um, then, um, you know, join another event sometime. If you're not already subscribed to our material, then please do make a donation or, or I encourage you to become a member. We have individual levels of membership. And we also have business levels of membership. Okay? And of course, again, those who are members, our donors, thank you very much because it's things like this, this program that totally comes from my heart. It's a pet project. It's not something that we got specific funding to do. It's this stuff that can be brought to you because of those donations. So thank you for that very much. And here's some upcoming events. Uh, December 15th, there's stargazing again. We do that once a month. Um, it's delivered online. Then at the end of January, we have our annual Raise a Pint for the Owyhee event, our donor recognition event that's at Burt's Growler Garage here locally, which I'm probably going to go to after this. Uh, and then um, in 2022, we're, or sorry, in January, we're releasing the 2022 calendar. So you see all of the conservation advocacy trips that are coming up, and you can sign up for those. And then um, as Steve um, had informed us earlier, that he and Emmy are putting together this awesome, one-of-a-kind modern backpacking class um, on, starting on March 10th. And there's three of those. You should sign up and come to all three of those and learn about some of the gear, and then we'll go out for an adventure together um, during that class. But more details on that in January. Okay. Well, with that, I'll stick around for a little while for any more rock questions if I didn't satiate you. <laughs>